Hello and welcome to another episode of A Slice of Health, the Candid Health Chat podcast, where we slice away health truth from health fiction. Join me and my friends as we challenge common health myths via chit chat powered by several cups of coffee. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us on social media and do visit us at a sliceofhealth.club. Let's get to today's episode. On today's episode, we are joined by Jadisola Ugeni of All Births. Jadisola is a qualified NHS midwife and she also has a special interest in providing care to mothers who have diabetes. On today's episode, we discuss a subject that is quite dear to my heart, and that is why black mothers die in childbirth. Black women are five times more likely to die in childbirth than their Caucasian counterparts. On this episode, we explore the reasons behind this and potential solutions to what has become a sorrow point to the hearts of many of us. Please enjoy the episode. So hello champions, welcome back to another episode. Today we have Jadisola of All Births with us and we're going to be talking about a very important topic, which is why do black mothers die? Welcome Jadisola. Hello, hello, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. So tell us a lot about yourself. Okay, so um, I'm Jadisola. I am an NHS midwife. I work in South East London, one of the busiest hospitals. Um, my speciality is diabetes in pregnancy, and my passion lies within improving care for all women, most especially for women of ethnic origins. Um, I recently wrote an article on FGM titled, What Can Be Done to Raise Midwife's Awareness of Female Genital Mutilation. Um, and I'm currently in the process of writing an article on why black women are still dying from, you know, pregnancy and, and childbirth in the UK. So yes, yeah, a little bit about me. That is awesome. Thank you so much. And how have you been coping with everything going on with coronavirus and, you know, working in um, hospital settings as well? It's been an interesting time. Um, I would say I'm taking it day by day and with, with each process, we're just trying to make sure that things are working for both the staff and the women. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to find better ways to manage patient care in, you know, in various times to come. So yeah, it's been okay. It's been okay. Okay. That's great. And so you talked about, um, so we've mentioned obviously uh, a few things so far. Uh, we talked about why black mothers die. Um, recently, I just thought about it actually recently, the, um, Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists alongside with the College of Midwives, um, had an event for International Women's Day talking about this specific topic. And I attended it. Um, and I wasn't impressed simply because it was it seemed as though there were sort of a lot of conversations about it without us actually coming to any sort of resolution or actually an action plan as to what we could do so why do you think black women black women die and black mothers die at the rate that that we do um very very interesting question now again something you would have probably known the embrace report recently in their last two reports showed that black women are five times more likely than yeah. any other counterpart to die mm. and looking at the reason why women die generally um in labor or um in pregnancy of just looking at the who's documentation one severe bleeding so most likely after birth so postpartum hemorrhages and black women are also at a higher risk of having a PPH. Mm. Um, now, for many reasons, one major reason is fibroids. Okay. Um, a lot of women don't even know they have fibroids until they become pregnant. They have a scan and they realize, oh, I have fibroids. They don't actually understand the impact it can cause. Um, one other reason why women die in general is infections, just sepsis. Um, as well as that high blood pressure now in the black community that is extremely high you know i've got family members that have high blood pressure um and then some women in, especially in the black community develop preeclampsia okay so it's an extreme version of high blood pressure in pregnancy and it can also happen later on so even after they've had their baby they've gone home they can actually still develop preeclampsia 
um, complications from delivery as well, um, and unsafe abortions. This is just a general aspect. And then breaking it down to why black women are dying, you've got an array of reasons. Mm -hmm. Again, like I explained, the postpartum hemorrhages, um, complications. So we're more at risk of developing things like diabetes in pregnancy. Okay. Um, now that comes from obviously the food we eat sometimes, family history, our socioeconomic status. But having something like diabetes is a major risk factor of complications in pregnancy and in childbirth. And one thing I've noticed in midwifery, um, I'm a black woman myself and I'm a midwife um, and I am of childbearing age. So I have to always put myself in people's positions. And what I find is a lot of black women sometimes um, don't get the right information um, regarding what they have specifically. And it can almost seem like, um, because this is a system that isn't always tailor made for us. Um, and later on, we'll probably discuss recommendations for practice is having more people like myself um, from every single department, every single ethnic, you know, um, group to represent these people. OK, so when I find in my role, I'm having to re-explain. OK, you do know that having um, so I had a lady who has um, palm oil um as part of her daily you know routine and um i'm just like that <laughs> whoa, whoa. daily goodness what is she eating and things like that and you would find that dietitian sessions don't include um african foods or asian foods in part of their what to eat and how to follow this guideline so women are going back and not sure what to eat and then they find that they then develop type 2 diabetes later on so it's always like an array of things so my job and my role is to educate give women information to then make informed decision i think that's one thing that's lacking is giving them the right information um, now that may be down to many factors um, one thing i do know is the, we are stretching the nhs so the time to even provide women this information sometimes isn't there um, and then them going to google is about looking at the right place of information um, so yes diabetes is one big thing um, and then there's cardiovascular diseases um, that are another major issue on its own that some women do present with in pregnancy and the embrace report recent and the latest one did say that was the leading cause of deaths mm -hmm. of women in general um and then can you imagine the women who are black who have cardiovascular diseases who have diabetes who have high blood pressure they are already at a high risk anyway and it's it's, it's crazy because you present yourself at booking as a low risk woman but most times you probably end up being high risk based on family history, um, based on things you discover early in pregnancy. Some women don't realize that um, they have sickle cell traits until they're, they're, they're at that, 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 that booking point in pregnancy. Um, so those are some of the reasons why some black women are dying in pregnancy and childbirth. Along with that, the socio economic status so i was reading recently that black um people in general are living in the poorest parts of the uk mm. followed by asians and mixed groups than our white counterparts now that was shocking to me because already they're at a disadvantage now this could even mean things like transport to hospitals. Now you'll find that some women may miss their appointments. Um, they don't turn up. They don't understand why they're having appointments and automatically they're labeled as, um, did not attend. Yeah. Did not attend. Um, whereas if you dig deeper, you would understand that probably she hasn't got anyone to look after her two children at home. Um, and if you were to explore that, maybe you'll be able to provide, um, individualized care, maybe going to her home. Um, these are little things that have caused 
or raise the alarms of why black women are dying. Um, along with that, there are historical, if we go back in, you know, to history and we look at the birth of, for example, gynecology, um, you will find that a lot of black women were used um, as but during slavery, um, they were used for certain yeah. procedures. Yeah, they were suspected um, of all sorts. Yes. Um, now you would think from there to now we would have come a long way, um, but there is an there, there is a racial bias sometimes um, in the system. Now that history has changed mindsets. So. Things like black women have um, tougher skin. Um, they're strong enough um, to go without an epidural or medication. Um, and you'll find some women would say, you know, I've had women say, oh my gosh, I never had the chance to be offered an epidural before or gas and air. Um, I just went through it alone or with pain. And you think, where does that come from? And there was a particular article um, that I read. It's more about racial bias and pregnancy. And it was in 2016. Mm. Um, and what it was saying was that black Americans are systematically undertreated for pain relative to white Americans. Um, now, again, we don't know why this is happening, but it is happening. And the question is, how do we stop it? Um, and I, for one, have experienced, um, it may not have been racial bias, but through also not understanding um, the walk a black woman goes through, makes it difficult for you to care for that woman. Now that's, you know, no one's fault. Again, it's more about education. I remember when I was a junior midwife or student midwife, um, we had um, one of our first cases of FGM and I'd never seen it before, never heard of it. And there was no FGM team in that hospital and everybody was quite, how can I put it? They didn't know what was going on. They didn't know anything about it. They was researching on Google. And I thought, how can we better her care if we don't even know anything about the condition she has? Um, and then come into a London hospital whereby it's so common um, and we've got a team that are there from the very beginning to the end. Just You can just see how her care will be much better because she has people who understand um, and can provide context of what she's going through or what she's been through without being judgmental or without giving her a one-way fits all. Well, we don't really know what... Um, is going on we don't we haven't seen this before so we might just perform a cesarean section you know um so things like that yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and you know uh we had someone talk about sickle cell a few weeks ago and we were talking about you know perceptions of pain and that has then perpetuated this mentality or this perception of black women which is obviously quite incorrect um and i like what you also said about the change in terms of moving into a London hospital. So where, where was it that you trained? This was in Kent. In Kent, yeah. So I think different pockets in the country have, um, obviously they have different cohort and it's not necessarily anyone's fault. It's just, you know, different people live in different areas. And so, you know, you could go into the Tesco's and you might be the only black woman in a certain area in yeah. the huge Tesco extra. Yeah. But, you know, if you, if you go into, you know, my local Tesco here in Collindale, uh, I'm, I'm, everybody around me looks like me. So I'm not going to feel self-conscious. I'm not going to feel uncomfortable. I'm going to find someone to ask where, you know, where the super malt is, you know, on the aisle. And that's exactly, and, you know, and those kind of things. And so you don't feel, you don't feel so isolated and you don't feel afraid to ask for help. And I think that is also one of the really crucial things in terms of talking about black women and why our outcomes in health is often, um, it, it is often quite poor. And I think that cuts across all all aspects of health. So why do you think it is that we don't we don't ask for help? Is it just the way we've been raised? Is it that there's a culture of silence, or is there fear in not knowing that actually help is available? I think 
um, it's a mixture of things. Mm. Um, one, I would say definitely upbringing. Mm. I think as a black Nigerian myself, it was almost like you've got to do things on your own. So, you know, empower yourself and you can do it and don't ask for help because, um, you know, if you ask for help, then that means that your success goes to somebody else as well. So it's psychological. Yeah. Um, and then I will say not seeing people like yourself mm. makes it difficult to open up. Mm -hmm. um, I heard um, a lady once say that she had a particular consultant during her pregnancy who had given her certain facts and her approach wasn't the nicest. And then immediately mm -hmm. she saw a black woman, a uh, black consultant, she asked to be under her care. And even though the evidence was still the same, mm -hmm. her approach was different. Mm -hmm. So it allowed her to open up more. Um, and I think that helps. I also think women have had experiences before where they weren't heard yes um so they think okay if that happened then why would they hear me now um i think that's one of the major things it's women thinking they don't actually have and this is also women in general they don't always fully have a voice um but this is where my role as a midwife and you know doctors consultants um, nurses, healthcare assistants come because we're there to empower mm. women, um, whoever they are, whatever race they are, however old they are, is to empower them. Um, and that's where I think building a relationship with um, the women during her care um, can help you break down those barriers and find out more about what she's going through, what her concerns are, and what she wants as well yeah definitely i think that's really crucial and you also talked about um, you touched on a few things in terms of medical conditions that then come to the fore when we then present pregnant so you know and i think that that is extremely crucial especially the fibroids which which you mentioned and i'm going to use my, myself as an example i've never been pregnant before i've not been pregnant yet but i've always had horrible periods and i'm a doctor and so i've always known what the most likely diagnosis is so endometriosis fibroids like i've always i've always known yeah. um but then towards the end of last year a few of my friends were like oh you know what i'm gonna go have my fibroid surgery and um like i can't just continue suffering i was like okay you know what let me actually go have a scan and see what's going on and they're like yay you've got fibroids and it was that kind of thing i was like yeah i kind of figured i probably had fibroids yeah. but if if I had then just gone and then gotten pregnant and just continued with this culture of silence or, oh yeah, well, all the women in your family have horrible periods. Yeah. You, yeah, just take an extra ibuprofen. And, but you have the knowledge, you know what's going on. And then you go, you get pregnant and then, you know, you, the fibroid grows alongside the pregnancy. You're in a lot of pain. Your baby doesn't grow, you know, so well there's you know growth restriction and there's so many things that come alongside that and i think there is that thing also of us telling our young girls that yeah your periods are going to be painful your periods are going to be heavy yeah. you're gonna be flooding you're not gonna be able to go into work or going to school one day a month and that is normal where do we come in terms of actually stopping it and saying no don't don't accept that as your life speak yeah. to somebody have a scan let's know what we're doing and if you need surgery that's not a bad thing yes you raise an amazing point um because many of these things start from way before women get pregnant yeah preconception care i think is the most important thing and i think that's where the government need to also put money and time and research in because that will save a lot of havoc later on for example taking it just to diabetes women come in at 12 weeks who are type 1 diabetics and they say they're pregnant and they tell me i haven't had folic acid i'm not on um aspirin and Unfortunately, like a week or four weeks later, they, they have a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. Their HbA1c is probably 98 or 100. And they just didn't know what to do prior to, pre to pregnancy. Now, I think letting our young girls know, if you have any concerns, 
raise it. And I think there is a culture in the black community sometimes where mothers and fathers dismiss the concerns of a young child. You know, there's that saying, you know, a child should be seen and not heard. So they grew up thinking you have to try and deal with it yourself or keep it in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's where the issues lie. And you will find that sometimes with medical conditions, people present later yeah. because they thought, well, it's just the back pain. Um, hopefully it will go away. It doesn't go away. So I think learning to voice out, and I, and I do have a few recommendations, especially voicing out concerns, even if it's small. And I always tell women in pregnancy, regardless of what their race is, if you don't feel baby moving mm. and you've gone to triage yesterday and baby was fine, but you're not happy today, this moment, call them again. Voice your concerns because you will regret it if you didn't. Okay, and it's such an important thing to to tell women prior to even getting pregnancy, adopt that culture of voicing and being bold and saying, I've got this condition or this issue and I need help. And you'll find that you're not alone. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So yeah. Definitely, definitely. And I think, you know, that feeling of isolation then continues to perpetuate the problems that we have and a lot of the anxieties as well. In your work with diabetes yes. in pregnancy, it, what, what, sh what should we say to young black women? So you were talking about, you know, this lady that has been eating a lot of food with palm oil. And, you know, in Nigerian culture, most of our soups have, have that in. Some people even cook the general rice with palm oil, which I don't, I don't, I don't understand, but to each of their own. Um, and I had um, Dr. Sandra Isibo, who does a lot of work with diet and diabetes and weight management. And I was asking her why it is that a lot of the referrals to sort of the um, diabetes dietitian courses don't seem to have a lot of information on the Indian diet. They don't talk about chapati. They don't talk about pounded yams and those kind of things that we eat often. And she was saying that it's probably also because our, our cohort of people don't attend a lot of those things and don't ask the questions about, okay, so what, what, how many, when I eat yam and I have five slices of yam in the morning with egg, how many calories is that? What, what does that look like? What does that equate to in terms of sugar? Yeah. That we don't actually ask those questions and we don't often go because we feel what's well, not going to be relevant to us. Yeah. Yeah. And so maybe that is, a, but how do we go about doing that? I think um, first of all, it's quite tricky because there's always um, a reason why some black women aren't attending. Um, but if we start off by even things like leaflets or um, booklets that show these foods um, will attract them even further. I, I recently got... Um, it's actually here. It's a carbs and cows counting book. Mm -hmm. And inside it does have information about um, chapati, masala, um, Nigerian chicken stew. And I thought this is amazing. And it's the newer version of it. Um, and I think when women see this, they already feel part of the care um or part of the pathway um and that's important for them i think bringing that out in leaflets um while you speak to them on the phone and just saying you know what make sure you've got a list of all the things that you normally eat so you can go through with your dietitian um and also having an inviting dietitian who explores those options so it goes both ways i think educating dietitians on different types of foods yeah. uh, also helps um, because then they're able to tailor make it's then, it's then tailor made to each woman mm -hmm. rather than it being generic because we're now in um, an area a society where we have a diverse set of people mm -hmm. you know we've got vegans we've got pescatarians we've got people who who eat African food, Caribbean food, Asian food, and we have to tailor it to each woman. I think it starts from education on our side as healthcare professionals, 
um, and then women will become more inviting. And just going back to that as well, in terms of the clinical encounters, so if a woman felt that maybe her midwife wasn't understanding or perhaps her midwife had bought into this incorrect stereotype of what a black woman is like. Um, and, you know, I always say that the African experience is not a monolith. It's, it, it's, not, it's not the same for anyone anywhere. What, what should yeah. she do if she felt, if she didn't feel comfortable and she, 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 she hasn't bought into the culture of speaking up or asking questions or felt silenced yeah. when she asked questions? Yeah, very good question. Um, I think one thing I would say women should stay away from is um having arguments right there and then and then storming off and then going home i would say make it formal write it down write everything that had happened get the name of the midwife or the the consultant or the doctor whoever it is write down your experiences find out and ask them who is your head of midwifery who is your senior i was about to speak to them about my care and go to that level because one of the things i find is especially black women they have concerns but then they don't voice it to the right people um so maybe friends and family or maybe social media um but yet other women for example would send emails to the head of midwifery or you know somebody maybe because they have connections um but then there's there's so many avenues for you to make complaints and i think when they realize how serious you are with your care which that shouldn't even be the case because we should care for all, all women equally then they would then take it a step further because whatever is in writing they can't ignore mm. um and also following up on your complaint being bold to say I would like to see somebody else if I'm not going to get the right care from you or if um, I'm not best suited for your area of expect, um, expertise. So definitely writing it down formally um, and then handing it into a senior member of staff. Mm -hmm. If you ask who the senior member of staff is, we will always share that with you. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things. And then following it, following it up. Mm. with the relevant member of, of staff yeah. um and if that doesn't get recognized then go a step further um you know go on their website and dig deep and call find out who you can speak to to resolve it because your voice matters and you need to be heard definitely definitely and what can we do sort of as a community because i think in our in a lot of our communities we often prefer it when we've heard someone who's done it or someone who's experienced it. And I, I know so-and-so did it. So yeah, sure, I'll go have that test. Or I'll go speak to my doctor about it because so-and-so did it as well. So how can we in our communities then start encouraging each other actually to think about these preconception um, you know, plans actually and preparation. So, you know, you're 21, you're 23, you're 25 and you want, you know, you want to have children in the future. What kind of things should we be talking about amongst ourselves while we're at brunch or Netflixing? What kind of things should we do together to then help each other? That's a great question. I think one thing we can do as black women is be transparent with each other. Um, sharing what we go through as women sometimes um, doesn't always happen. I think there is a culture of what happens in my home stays in my home and um, you tend not to share experiences. And recently I have a friend who has polycystic ovarian syndrome and I was quite shocked because I'd never really heard of anyone having that. Mm -hmm. um, and then my sister also ended up having it you know she was recently diagnosed with having it and it was amazing because I was able to connect the two and they were able to share stories and being that my friend is much older than my sister she now has a plan of care for the next few years and I think not having people around you to share information about you know smear tests and um, fibroids you know infertility um high blood pressure, diabetes, all these things, if you're not hearing it from fellow people that look like you, you will feel alone. And I think we should all be more open and then there are, there should be more of us 
on social media, on platform. And I know not everyone likes social media, but that is where people are getting their information from. So if they're able to see somebody who has the right information, the right evidence, looks like them, on a platform they use daily and they're getting information from there, then that would also help yeah. get their mind into a get their mind into a place ready for pregnancy and childbirth. Right, that is great. And you we, you mentioned something earlier about how the government can help and so why they should focus a lot of their efforts into the preconception stage. What else can they do in terms of you know the actual you know you're already pregnant and the the actual process through labor and post um and postpartum care as well is there anything that you can suggest that might make a difference to these numbers very good question again um so in regards to post delivery um <clears throat> one thing that i would say women should get into the habit of is again speaking out on their mental health um how they're feeling reaching out to friends and family making yourself accountable to friends and family um also following up on what has happened during your pregnancy so for example some women who have had high blood pressure in pregnancy there is a likelihood that you may develop it later on in life so not to ignore it and think okay i've had my baby now everything's fine i'm going to go back to the way things were change your lifestyle change your diet if for example you were diabetic in pregnancy um we all know it, it does go once the is delivered try and change your diet so make changes within your diet and your lifestyle um, based on what you've experienced in the pregnancy and this is for all women anyway but specifically for black women <laughs> making sure that you don't go back to the same way you know life was before make changes um so i think that's a big thing post delivery and also if you are thinking of trying again for um for ch for more children you now have an understanding of what your risk factors are so you're able to plan in a you know more effectively mm -hmm. so i think that's that's what, what I would suggest post delivery. And in terms of preconception counselling, obviously what I what I find in my practice actually is quite a lot of ladies would come in sort of five weeks pregnant, six weeks pregnant, um, and they're like, oh doctor, I'm pregnant, I did the test this morning. Great, are you happy? Yes, I'm happy. Okay, good. Um, have you been taking folic acid? No, what's that? Um, okay, vitamin D? Uh, no, what's that? Um, were you trying to get pregnant? Yes, I was. Yeah. and so it wasn't an accident no it wasn't <laughs> so um and this you know this is sort of a thing it's sort of it's sort of like a template in my head that I go through yeah. and it's often the same answers yeah how can we encourage ladies to actually when you are trying to get pregnant actually think about it speak to a doctor about it you know try to get some information about it and actually know the right things that you should be doing because like you also said about you know aspirin um if you already have a diagnosis of something like type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes it's so important that we have a tight control on your blood pressure and your sugars before you even start trying to get pregnant so what, how would you encourage them to do that um one thing i would definitely say is try and see your gp um regularly um your obstetrician your gynecologist regularly and this is not just with when you've got a problem i think most um many black women would only go to their gp or the hospital when there's a problem mm -hmm. but you can get regular checkups even if you feel like i want to just check my blood pressure i want to check my blood levels i want to check my iron levels um my vitamin d levels um as well as that making sure that you don't miss appointments so i think it's important because even at those appointments that you you're that, that you go to you can then ask and say do you know what i'm trying for a baby doctor what do you think i need to do so getting the right information before every step is vital um and i think that only comes and stems from information um and it's now about how do we disseminate the information to these women um and that's i think a recommendation for practice now um 
so that's something I would suggest regular checkups even if you're not ill see your GP discuss your health because your health matters mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and in terms of the because obviously post um post -part partum deaths are still counted as deaths that occur during you know several weeks and several months even after the um after the delivery and you'd mentioned about sepsis, you mentioned about um, postpartum hemorrhages as well. Is there anything else in that, in that period that we should also make sure that women are aware of or that they should look out for as well and things that might increase their risk of, um, of us losing them? Um, yes, you mentioned quite a few, yes, sepsis. So infections, um, now obviously after having a baby, yes, you may feel a bit unwell after you know your body you may feel quite tired they're all normal but if you start to feel more unwell as the days go by definitely voice your concerns infections if you're feeling very warm hot to touch um if you're unable to eat if you feel very lethargic all these signs should start ringing alarm bells is there an infection yeah. where is it what can i do um blood pressure like i was saying preeclampsia that is a big thing post delivery um that women ignore um for example having recurring headaches um and blurry vision is not normal um ask to get checked ask to ask to be seen um and if you are given medication post delivery ask why they're giving it to you and continue taking it um, see your gp post delivery you know don't miss those those appointments of your gp as well as that your mental health yeah. um, is a big thing post delivery if you feel like you need some extra support ask for ask for it whether it be your family and friends or healthcare professionals um, voice that voice your concern um i think also again bleeding is another thing as well post delivery some women can experience bleeding two three four weeks after delivery um and i think that's something you need to be mindful of but yeah those are a few things post delivery that i would say be mindful of um and voice your concerns if anything does arise yeah. And um, we talked about mental health, which is so crucial, especially in the perinatal period. But I find that a lot of women don't want to talk about their mental health in that time because they're so afraid that you're going to take my baby away. What would you say to them in, in, that, in that time, you know, women who are struggling really badly with postnatal depression? Because a lot of women do, but, but they don't talk about it because they're afraid that this is an invitation to social services. Yeah yeah that, that 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 is true i think women especially during their pregnancy um have history of depression and they, they don't let you know um and then later on you find um they may have gone into psychosis or they're finding it very difficult post delivery to care for themselves and their baby and i think mental health is a big thing in the black community that isn't spoken about enough um and again that one comes down to transparency um we need to talk more about how we feel um and i think not being one thing i want to say is there is a stereotype that healthcare professionals are there to call social services straight away when there's an issue no we're actually there to help and make a care plan and if that means we come to your home every day you know for the next two weeks just to see how you're doing then that is what we will do and if that means we need to refer you for extra support then that's what we will do um and i think for you opening up and sharing that you have you know mental health concerns shows me as a midwife how proactive you are in trying to better yourself um but if you hide it from us then that's where certain issues arise because then maybe you're not able to cope yeah. with things and then you look like um you're neglecting your your um your needs etc so i think definitely opening up and if that means finding somebody that 
you think you can share that with if that means it's it's the porter in the hospital or the student midwife you do that um that's a major thing we don't want you suffering in silence or suffering alone and having to deal with it and then the perception of healthcare for you um is blurred because you think that's not a place that i can seek help from or i need to change that narrative because that's where we want you to seek help and to speak out more on so definitely it's a big thing in our community that is, that is so crucial thank you so much and i think that you know we've, we've talked a lot about sort of breaking the culture of silence and i think yeah. that is that is so crucial and i think it comes through when we're talking about all our um our health conditions and our wellness conditions in the black in in the black community it's actually yeah. talking talking a bit more about it then definitely empowers us um, yeah. to, to, to make the changes that we need so if you give our listeners a championship point for this episode Oh, yes. Um, so definitely women, um, black women, the statistics need to definitely decrease, you know, as soon as possible. And I think one thing I always say is one, voice your concerns um, to whoever you feel comfortable with, to any healthcare professional, know your family history. OK, come prepared, um, plan. Um, if you are thinking of getting pregnant, plan speak to a gynecologist get everything sorted beforehand report any racial bias um especially in writing um and for those that are out there who are black doctors nurses midwives healthcare assistants you guys are the policy makers the game changers we need to step up and change the way our services are for um black women black men um so yeah those are my take home that's fantastic points. thank you so much and where can our listeners find you online um so you can find me on instagram it's all births underscore um and yes that's where you can find me where all the information is yeah fantastic thank you so much for coming on thank you thank you for joining us on today's episode do share this podcast with two people who have not heard about us before. Remember that this podcast in no way replaces advice from your own doctor or physician. Do subscribe and follow us on social media. Leave us a review on iTunes so that others can access the amazing content. And do join the club at a sliceofhealth.club and drop us some suggestions or questions that you might have. Don't forget to be a health champion wherever you go by separating health fact from health fiction. Thank you.